Nebraska couldn't keep pace with Illinois on Saturday after losing Casey Thompson to an injury and fell 26-9 to the fighting Illini. Concern mount as the Huskers scramble to ready a team without their starting quarterback. Can the offense get back on track as they welcome in another staunch defense in Minnesota? Will the defense find answers to another strong running attack? Tonight we recap the Illinois game and try to answer some of those questions with former Husker and NFL tight end Zach Potter. Sean Callahan will join us to discuss more on a busy week of Big Red recruiting. It's all coming up next on Big Red Wrap. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Severe and welcome to Big Red Wrap Up on Nebraska Public Media. Nebraska was on track in the first half to have more yards against Illinois than any other team, but then Casey Thompson went out. We're going to talk about that tonight. Former Husker Jay Moore and Sean Callahan joining us in the first half, mm -hmm. especially when Nebraska first came out before the first interception. Felt pretty good about the way they looked? Yeah, well, you didn't like the initial surge at Illinois. I think they scored about four or five plays initially, mm -hmm. so that was a little concerning. But it wasn't, it wasn't Chase Brown just downhill. Right. They were able to throw the ball. Kind of attacked Nebraska's man-to-man -man situation. A lot of mesh, mesh routes. That's what we're going to do against a lot of man-to-man -man coverage. But we're able to kind of get the run game going. We saw a couple different wrinkles in the offense. And you're like, okay. We get some stops on, off or on defense. You're like, oh, wow. You know, 9-6. And you're like, we can do this. And then, you know, all of a sudden you get the incomplete pass to Ramir Johnson. And then things just go completely south from there on out. But early on. Yeah, there was a lot to be happy about. Obviously, it's a long football game, and you knew this was going to be a close game. I mean, it was. Thought it, yeah, yeah. You, you thought, if it, but that's the kind of start you'd want, other than you know Illinois' quick touchdown. But uh, Nebraska hung in there until Casey got hurt. Then it, it was there was nothing much you could do. And the backup quarterbacks didn't look prepared. Turnovers. I mean, four to one. Even if Casey's healthy and they go four to one, Nebraska's still not winning that football game. So, just little little disheartening with the backup quarterback situation. The turnovers and the defense played well enough. I thought they played pretty good through four quarters to win, to give Nebraska's offense a chance. But again, you have four four uh, four turnovers and 30, 30, uh, 30 yards in total in the second half. That's just that's just not going to get it done against not only Illinois but uh, a Georgia Southern or a North Dakota. Anybody? Did you feel? Were you surprised first of all that Logan Smothers didn't come out after half? Yeah, just the whole decision making of the quarterback situation because they go with Logan. I think. People were surprised by that right yeah. away. Like, oh, wow, Logan Smothers. Well, that's the first time, really. Often. They had gone to him on a few gadget plays gadget this plays, year, right. and that was it. And so he gets the call, and it felt like Illinois was prepared for Logan Smothers. And that probably threw Nebraska off a little bit. Like, man, they knew exactly what he was going to do when he came in the game. And um, Mickey Joseph, of uh, when he did his halftime interview, even said, well, we're going to go back to Logan. And yeah. I think that really was confusing. Uh, I think Mark Whipple obviously said we got to go with Chuba to, to make the throws. Yeah. Uh, but then today you heard Mickey Joseph say, you know, Chuba um, was nervous, and, and we've got to settle him down and get him ready this week. And I, and I think he's a little banged up too. Um, he's been hurt kind of throughout the year. The thing that surprised me was I, that third and two that Logan didn't get in the first half, about 4:31 left in the game in the in the first half. I think if he gets that, and Nebraska's 13-12 or 13-9, I think he comes back in. Yeah, it, it feels like such that was a the short leash. Yeah. And can he execute the short throws yeah. that maybe Lo that Chubba was having a hard time with? Like, look, we're not asking Logan Smothers to make elite NFL out throws here. Like, just distribute the ball. Get the ball to Trey Palmer. How about that? Figure out a way to throw a short pass to Trey Palmer. And I think he could have done that. So I'll, I'll be curious what they do this week if they split him up a little bit more or pick one guy to roll with. Yeah, one catch for one yard for Trey Palmer. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of questions heading into next week. As always, we invite you to join our conversation tonight. Our friends from the University of Nebraska's College of Journalism and Mass Communications are here manning the phones. Hey, guys, awaiting your calls. As they wait, they're enjoying some Valentino's pizza. Our sports intern, Sam, is leading the charge. Hey, Sam. You can also text, email your comments and questions to bigred at nebraskapublicmedia.org. We're also watching the social media channels. As always, post your comments and questions to Facebook and Twitter. And we'll try to get as many of them as we can throughout the show. Now it's time to take a deep dive into the playbook from Saturday and joined by Jay Moore, who's inside the huddle. All right, we got three plays tonight. Normally we do two, two, but we got three tonight. So we're going to highlight this first, uh, the wheel route uh, touchdown by Chase Brown. Nebraska, it kind of comes down to these three guys right here. And Nebraska is not communicating well in the front. We talked about already about Nebraska playing a lot of man defense. Well, into the boundary, which is this side, Nebraska wasn't a man situation. But down into the field, Nebraska was 
in a zone situation. So a lot of miscommunication, uh, but literally it comes down to these three guys right here I'll highlight. Now as they plus play, you're going to get a lot of mesh concepts, a lot of crossing routes. That's what teams will do in man-to-man -man situations because they create natural, a natural rub situation. So as you can see here, Chase Brown's going to come out the backfield, crossers by the slots, uh, guys in the slot formation here, and then uh, you get kind of a, a, slant, a slug go, slant and go out of the wider seat of the top of the boundary. Now, as you look here, now, I know they're in a man-to-man -man situation on this top side because the safety, I believe this farmer, is chasing him so hard down here. And you have the rest of the guys looking to pass everything off. Miscommunication by Tanner, Rymers on the back. A lot of times I like to see, you call it an IO, inside out. If my guy goes out, you take him. If, and then usually another guy's going to come underneath, you switch it. Just a complete miscommunication on this. I think Illinois uh, uh, missed on a similar play earlier in the game as well. They're able to capitalize on this. Now, I'm sure you, a lot of you have already seen this play. It's kind of going around on social media. The block field goal. Uh, you, this is a situation, it's, it's a scoring situation. It's about scoring points. You've got to take pride in the ability to score points because they're, just not, hard to, they're not easy to come by. But we're going to highlight Ben Hart. Main, he's the main issue here because he does not protect inside. And this is where his, the guy's going to come right through to block the field goal. As we highlight this, boom, he's able to hop over. But... I, I can't put the blame all on Ben Hart because I'm, I'm not sure who the guard was next to him. His hand is also down in on the ground. Normally a situation, you have to, you're always, you protect, you step down to your inside, but you still get that outside arm up just to get some sort of a hurdle, a block on him, not done right. This is how it looks on this other side. That's how it should have been done. Very, very poor. These guys should have got an earful from the coaching staff for this effort. And then... Boom, you take away points, steal a little momentum going. Not great in this situation. So let's fast forward through the sack fumble and that Casey Thompson gets knocked out on. Nebraska's in a tackle over scenario. So on this side, you just have a tackle tight end. It's Borichter, uh, Ben Hart, Cochran, I think Latovsky's over here. They're going to run a little stunt here. Nothing, nothing crazy. You're going to get a cross face. Boom. You got the... the the defensive end linebackers that come underneath, there's just a little just too much commitment. I, they pick it up okay, but as soon as he crosses his feet over here and just gets so heavy on him, you're not able to come out. I'd like to see them understand where their help is. You had, uh, you, you had Brewington coming out of the backfield here, the chip release, so there was more help. Boom, doesn't do it. You get him. Corcoran also gets beat up top, so it wasn't going to be uh, 49. It was going to be the other guy making the play. All of a sudden, boom. This is where the whole uh, momentum slipped and flipped right here from Nebraska. And uh, we all know the end of the story for this one. And we're talking about guys, Jay, that haven't had a whole lot of snaps, haven't played a position in a long time, um, really getting their chance for the first time this year in terms of Latowski I'm talking about. So Yeah. Well, it, that's just the thing is <laughs> there has to be a trust, right, with the coaches. So yeah. he must do, do it right in there, but it's just hard. You, you got to understand it's, that's a technique thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not faulting the effort. It was the effort's fine. Right. It's understanding you just can't overcommit yourself. Usually if something is coming out, if something's going out, something's probably coming in mm -hmm. and just fighting that and also know where your help is. You know, Burlington's going to be up there. Don't be in such a rush to shove some out there. You know, the help's there to chip. You got time, come back and, and fold off and, yeah. and get a hand somehow, some way to protect Casey. And then you didn't have help from Grant because he was going out Correct. Into, the, into the route. That leads us to this week's all-new sideline survey. If Casey Thompson can't start, who'll be Nebraska's quarterback against Minnesota? Will it be Chubba Purdy, Logan Smothers, or Matt Masker? Who's going to make the start? 56% of the people say Logan Smothers. 40% say Chubba Purdy. And Matt Masker's mom, dad, uncles, and brothers got 4% right there. <laughs> Head to the website right now and cast your vote on who will be starting at quarterback. Your feel is... <sighs> No, that's it. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Logan got more care. I, I, I don't know if they'll start him, but I think he'll play a lot more this week. Yeah. I, I think you have to commit to Logan. It, just to have the, the QB run game in, involved with him. I mean, if you're going to say Chubba's, you play Chubba because you can throw it, that what I saw on Saturday has not convinced <laughs> me at all. So that's, I don't know how you continue to play him. I will say, Jay, and you know this, you've seen it. Very few snaps, maybe 10% of the snaps he's getting in practice mm -hmm. for the last few weeks. If he gets an entire week, and now they're going back and forth, getting 50% of the snaps mm -hmm. with Logan, maybe that makes a difference in his confidence and what he can maybe, do. Maybe, maybe, but it's just, a, I know, and you think on, you got to think of what Whipple wants to do, yeah. right? And obviously he wants to be able to throw the ball. But can you, is, is there enough there to 
hang in there with Minnesota to do that? Can you beat Minnesota with, with Chubba Purdy? Or do you commit to a QB run game, something that you don't like to do, that he said he wants to put the air, uh, you know, put the air underneath it, and slow the game down, control the time possession, you know what, it's okay if we're, it's third and four and we're going to punt and flip the field. And just take control somehow of this game because you just, you can't. I mean, the time possession was completely lopsided again this week. Yep. So you you have to play smart, uh, efficient football now when you're without your, your starting quarterback. You just have to do it. And you have to weigh the pros and the cons. And I think Logan Smothers just brings so much more to the table with the QB run game. He can throw it. He might not be able to stretch the field like he Casey. He ball well against Iowa yeah, until that turnover But let's happens. just get some high percentage throws. He doesn't need to throw these, you know, 60-yard bombs. I mean, those are fun and everything, but how about we just get some nice dig routes, some some mesh routes, some you know, just Foster's some drag right. routes. Yeah. Boom, easy high percentage throws. Keep the momentum going. Get some confidence. Then you want to take the top off the defense? Go ahead and do it. But until then, you got to find something you can kind of hang your hat on. And I think that's getting Logan Smothers involved in the QB run game. There were some people out there who were saying, well, Kansas State had their backup, and Kansas <laughs> had their backup. Kansas State's backups played for three years in like nine starts, and Kansas's backup was a full-time starter for three years. So it's a little bit different when you have a guy at Purdy that has very little experience actually taking snaps. Yeah, Will Howard at Kansas State played a lot for Skylar Thompson, and he yeah. was projected to be In 20 and 21, yeah. And then Adrian came in and right. took the job. So, yeah, you're right. Totally different situation. Trevor Purdy has started a game in his career at Florida State. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got experience. Logan Smothers, as we know, has started a game at Nebraska against yeah. Iowa. But nothing like the Will Howard situation at K-State where he's got legit, yeah. you know, multiple games starting experience and you just get better once you start playing more you get better I'm sure Casey Thompson and his first career start wasn't great either yep and another thing you have that has to happen is establishing the run game obviously we watch Anthony Grant again looks like he's a little uncertain back there and I don't know if they have a number two back with Gabe Irvin out yeah it's really really tough and AJ Allen I mean don't forget about with him, him out as well yeah. AJ Allen was pushing uh, Anthony Grant and yeah. so just that situation because Jack Wesley not running well. I mean, he's trying to go outside. Not seeing the hole. He's not. He's not an out to go outside guy, and, and and that was a bad play for him. He was negative yards in that game on Saturday. But Anthony Grant needs more than 12 carries. If Nebraska wants to have a chance in any of these final four games, they've got to get him back in that that 20 area with his total carries. He had a play where he had a first down running to the right to West Stadium, and decided that he was going to try to get more. End up losing two yards. Mm -hmm then Nebraska doesn't convert on third down. It's one of those where he, he doesn't look like he is certain about what's going on either. So I think everybody's a little messed up because well, of the so, offensive line. Right. And sometimes you, I imagine as a running back, I mean, you, you, you struggle to, to solidify a run game. You're trying to have that home run hit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to know, let's just stick that foot in the ground and get north and south and get that first down to continue momentum, get the chains going, don't, you know, and, and keep that momentum on your side and in the time of possession. So I would like to see Ramirez. I think I'd that's love just, it, yeah. you want to talk about high percentage throws, hitting the, hitting the running back out of the backfield. Obviously, Ramir had the, 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 drop. In, the drop early in the game, but he's, he's shown a lot of capabilities to catch out of the backfield. And he played a ton of snaps last year. The guy's been there and has done that. I just don't know why he's, he's been on the milk carton all year. You got to take the yards when you can. You'll never go broke taking a profit. Correct. Remember that. Defensively, <laughs> going against Mo Ibrahim, we know how good of a running back he is. How do you think Nebraska matches up with Minnesota's offense? They've got to get them off schedule. I think if Minnesota is on schedule, they're really good on offense. And, and that's been the problem. Nebraska has had a hard time slowing down the Minnesota run game the last few years. Ibrahim um, is going to be going for his third 1,000-yard season. And whoever they bring in after him always seems to be good. They do, yeah. I mean, they, they have some of the best running back development in the conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they remind you of a Wisconsin, uh, the way they keep putting out running backs year after year after year after year. And Tanner Morgan is one of the winningest quarterbacks in the Big Ten and, and right. in all of college football. You know, he's, I think he's 27. <laughs> I'm joking. He's, he's probably 23, 24. He's 24, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, married guy, I think. So, he's, I mean, he's, yeah. he's not your typical guy. I mean, it feels he's been in college since 2017. Wow. Uh, when, when you look at his career and, and just what he brings to their offense. Well, you think about the way Nebraska's defense played against Illinois, though. Because there was a couple times where they were put in bad spots. They got stopped. Mm -hmm. They forced field goals. They are fighting. They're tough, tough. I'll give them all the credit in the world, you know, I was very surprised and I was very um, relieved early on showing their ability to stop the run and get some stops without having Nick Henrich present in that game, and obviously him being out for the year. So there is something to hang your hat on and the, their ability. Nebraska's defense has done a phenomenal job after all the turnovers that the, or poor special teams plays that they've had yep. that they're able to hold the offenses to three points. That is an absolute game changer. 
defensively, just from a mindset, momentum standpoint. And I got to commend him for that. I mean, Bill Bush is what he's able to do. I know he doesn't have a full stack of cards to, to, to work with, but the, the game plans, the, the effort that they're putting forth here, the, the timely calls. I love the Luke Gifford sack coming off the edge, you know, a free, free blitzer scenario. They they played well enough to win the football game. It's just you you can't yeah. you can't turn the ball. There's a there's a Gifford set. Kind of an stuff. amoeba front there because no one really got their hand on the ground. Yep. They were all Love kind it. of adjusting. Love it. And you could tell Ian Lai's offensive yep. line struggled. Talking about that defense and the way they played, Sean. A lot of guys are playing, right? Ernest Hausman gets benched, comes back, is playing really hard. Some other guys that maybe weren't getting a chance to play are playing now. Um, and Herzog, you, you see the depth kind of developing, even with all the injuries. I know that's one of the things Mickey has talked about. He wants to see that rotational depth on the defense. You go back to that game in Ireland, you had guys like Colton Feast playing 70 snaps, yeah. and, and, and just Ty Robinson was – pushing 80 snaps in that game in Dublin. That was not a winning defensive formula. Um, Jay, you're a defensive lineman. <laughs> I mean, how many times in your career did you play over 50 snaps? 60 but, but, snaps. Well, yeah, I would say majority. We pl played a lot of snaps. I would say over half the time. I bet you were, I was over 50%. Yeah, but that, that front four, you guys were veteran. Had a lot of starts mm -hmm. on you. We did. No, you guys snaps. I know, I'm just saying, yeah. we, I would say majority of the time, I was over, you know, 50, 50 snaps. You know, I've had, we've had games, I'm trying to think back, we never had anything over 100. I want to say my senior year against Kansas, we ran 94 snaps. Yep. That was an overtime game. Yeah. And I think I played like 60-some in that. Yeah. I, I mean, it also the interior guys got yeah, th there changed was, out. Yeah. Uh, correct. But you had – I mean, I had Barry Turner behind me. Yeah. Right? He was, you could trust him to come in sure. to spell. That's not the scenario here. I don't know. The depth is, is definitely a concern with the defensive line. Yeah, you, you just – it's hard for big bodies. You can't, you can't be out there 70, 80 snaps. And get snaps. quality out Oh, God, no. There's, there's yeah. no way. A little easier for lighter defensive ends, but still that's not what you want. You'd like to have eight guys you can rely on just to interchange. And we've seen, like, Mosai Newsom get more reps. He did. I mean, they, they've kind of, like, gone to the back end of the rotation to play some of these guys. And I think the staff is like, look, we got to keep guys fresh because we can't just play the same dudes – 70 snaps. Yeah, and the backup outside linebackers are getting there, too, and Gunnarsson and uh, Butler as well. It's time to take a look back at a very beautiful day. It was a great-looking day at Memorial Stadium. <laughs> and you had the five different parachuters come in there. That was awesome as well. Early on, not surprising, Illinois came out and played just like they played. A lot of crossing routes, hitting the crossing routes, wide receivers blocking. Look at this play here. You get two – this is the running back, Chase Brown, making two blocks – to help Juice Jr. go down there and score to give a 6-0 lead because, of course, missed extra point there by Illinois as Nebraska is down 6-0. Nebraska comes back early on. Good throw here to Anthony Grant, a play we hadn't seen a lot before now. Probably one they added over the bye week. And then Grant comes back again. Best run of the day. He goes for uh, 22 yards, I believe, on this yep. run, uh, which was the longest run for Nebraska. And then the, I'm not sure what happened here is because Trey Palmer actually pushes off and pushes defender into the outside throw. It's something that got to go, go, to, go to the sideline, right, that throw? Either that or he was trying to sit down and he's got to be put right on the money. But obviously there was some miscommunication there between the two. Then deep middle here, throwing across his body. You're not supposed to do that, but sometimes you get away with it. Alante Brown with one or two big catches he had in the game. And then this is a beautiful play. Look at the blocking by the offensive lineman. This is, this is a well time. We haven't you've seen we've seen Brewington quite a bit this year, but that was just a well designed play, just a thing of beauty. The timing for everything was was uh, very well done. And whatever was wrong with Tommy Bleakwood early, Bleak wrote it's not now. He has been nailing, he's been money there in um, his field goals. Three six, Nebraska down to Illinois. Uh, back comes Nebraska again. Casey Thompson, this is a perfect throw. Beauty. Had time. Look at all that time he yeah, had. Yeah, what was that? Too. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, he was just like, holy smokes, I could have a cup of coffee back here. Second big catch there for Alante Brown. And then you have this throw here. I think both defenders thought they could intercept the ball. No. Look who's running faster than Vokalek. <laughs> <laughs> Side judge. Everyone we were watching the game was like, why is he running so slow? I know he's been beat up. Yeah, like, he's got bad going. Yeah, he's got a bad ankle. Get that piano off your back. Nebraska <laughs> takes the lead there, 9-6. We used to always say a watermelon truck. You know, it's got it attached <laughs> to your back. And then there's the hit. You showed it earlier. Ball goes up in the air. It gets intercepted. But even more so, Casey Thompson takes that hit on the arm and then falls on the elbow. And you know he's had surgery on his hand. Uh, you could see him sitting there holding his hand, trying to move the pinky and ring finger, and he couldn't. I was watching him through the binoculars, and you could tell that something was wrong there. He goes to the tent and then leaves the game, of course. Chase Brown runs so hard for a little guy. He's, he's, he is a good bag. It's amazing the, the power and energy he's able to have. 
when he gets 35 to 45 snaps a game, yeah, that's that's credit to him and their strength and conditioning staff. Gifford made that hit. He still ran him into the end zone. 13-9 right there. Nebraska gets stopped, gives the ball back to Illinois, and Illinois goes on a great drive. 11 plays, 72 yards. Nebraska got zero stuff plays on this drive. It was the first time during the game that they hadn't got at least a tackle for loss or a stuff, and they go 11 plays and 72 yards, go to halftime up 20-9. to Tommy DeVito comes back, makes this throw to Juice Jr., and he fumbles. Just a, a gift. gift. An absolute gift to Nebraska. You're like, okay, here we go. Then obviously we see what happens here yeah. coming up in a few plays. But yeah. that's, a, hey, that's, we'll take that all day. That's a gift. And then Chubba Purdy comes back and makes a gif uh, <laughs> that was tweeted out a lot. I'm not sure who he was throwing to here, Sean. Yeah. But, yeah. There's sorry, nobody here. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in front. That's all right. You know, yeah, just him rolling out. Like, I'm like, all right, what's he doing? You know, it's it just like, who? Run out of bounds, throw it away. Watches too much Mahomes. Yeah, that's Mahomes and Steph Curry. Worst thing to happen to players. <laughs> they think they can do those guys. Chase Brown with a big run there. But Nebraska gets a stop once again and forces a field goal 23-9 to against the defense stood up over and over and over again. It could have been much worse. It wasn't the defense playing as well as they did. Anthony Grant here trying to make something out of nothing like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, again, I, the effort, you got to like it. But, again, you, sometimes this happens. You just you, – you hit on the football. He just can't do that. Second fumble of the year for Grant. Second fumble. And then you have the final field goal, final point scored there. 26 to 9. Illinois wins. We go to the final stats as Brett Bielema is now 2 and 0 against Nebraska this time as Illinois. 108 yards to 188 yards to 60. And look at the time of possession. Almost 40 to 20 again. It's something we've seen over and over again from Nebraska. And in the second half, 29 total yards for Nebraska. I believe minus nine rushing in that um, in that second half. Coming up next, we'll be joined by former Husker and NFL tight end Zach Potter. As we go to break, images from Saturday afternoon, courtesy of Hale Varsity. Stay with us. We're back soon. Tough loss on Saturday. You know, the, the boys really hurt after this one, so the coaches. But um, this week, we just had to get back to work. You know, I'm confident that they'll come back and bounce back this week. We talked this morning, and they guarantee me that they, they're still ready to go. They're ready to get after it and, and be the best team on Saturday. It's frustrating um, looking back at it. We had a great game plan. Um, coach put us in great positions. Had a great week of practice, uh, probably our best week of practice. Had a little off day on Thursday, but it wasn't anything uh, major. Um, and uh, we just got to execute. That's all that is. 
that obviously we got another challenge this week. Um, we have the 24 hour rule, you know, we watch the film um, and uh, put it put it behind us um, and getting ready for Minnesota. So it'll be another challenge. You got five, six year seniors this this week starting for Minnesota. This is another six year quarterback that we're going against. That's that's unheard of. You know, that's not happening on that in that other conference. So it's just an older league, but this league execute and they don't make many mistakes. Everybody has to be poised in order for this offense to work. So, you know, just working all together as leaders, making sure we stay on top of each other, uh, handle our responsibilities, and we'll be fine. I, I feel really great about Nebraska um, and where it's going. You know, I feel like, you know, we, you know, I know there's a lot of uncertainty in um, a lot of areas, but, you know, for me right now, it's just a lot of focus about each week, um, each game, just one day at a time for us. You know, we, our motto is day by day, and that's kind of how we just attack things each day. It's time for some of the best of social media now over the weekend. First up, Parker on Twitter shared the Spirit Halloween costume meme that you've seen all over the place. This time was Mickey Joseph. It comes with a headset, Husker hat, and play sheet, but sold separately, swagger, energy, and the get back coach. <laughs> over on Facebook, Troy said he was very excited about the Nebraska game, but as you can see from the Tommy Boy meme here or picture here, Chris Farley excited to start off with but basically pulled his hair out as that second half went on for Nebraska. Welcome back to Big Red Wrap-Up. I'm Michael Severe, Jay Moore, Sean Callahan, and joined by former Husker and NFL tight end Zach Potter. What's up? How you been? Happy to be here. You know, another season, um, another season that's kind of slipping away from us a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, this state, the, this fan base, um, we're always going to, you know, watch our Huskers and we're always going to have something to talk about. We're always just trying to figure out uh, how we can keep getting better, whether we're, you know, uh, having a, a losing season or a winning season. We just have to find ways to keep getting better. You are one of the more positive former Huskers that I've ever known. You never picked against them when I had you doing picks. Never. Um, how could you pick against your own team? Because they're playing Michigan in a couple weeks? No, um, let me ask you this. They can win by one somehow, <laughs> some way. That is true. <laughs> definitely possible. It is still a game. Um, do you, have you seen the improvement since Scott Frost was let go and Mickey came in and they've changed some stuff on defense? I just think you've seen, uh, it, it, whether it's improvement or just overall um, a different feel from the players, whether it's energy. Um, obviously, you know, Mickey's great as far as energy on the sidelines. And so you've seen seen that from the players, I mm -hmm. feel like. And so, yes, I think you've seen some changes. Um, obviously, the wins and losses haven't all been there, but I think we're competing, which is, I think, uh, something that I don't want to say we lack, but we're at least doing a lot better. Zach, the word development's been used quite a bit here, and obviously that's been lacking in this pro football program for a long time, you and I were developed mm -hmm. enough to be able to be fortunate to play on Sundays. Yeah. I don't remember being developed. I just we just kind of showed up and went to work, right? What does develop from on our end in what Nebraska is going through in, into the future look like to you? I think ultimately a lot of it comes down to the players, and that goes back to the kids that the coaches, um, new and old, have recruited. You got to you got to recruit kids that want to be coached, kids that want to work hard, put in the extra effort, whether it's in the weight room, the film room, just after practice. Whether you know, I remember, you know, as a D lineman at the time, it's like, hey, why don't you go work on long snapping? Who knows? But you never know what that could do for you down the road. Just finding different things that you can keep adding to your tool belt, and I think that just goes back to the type of kids that we continue to recruit, whether it's now and going forward. And that's the thing I've enjoyed with you know Mickey since he's taken over. It's because the thing is that's kind of neat about Mickey from a recruiting standpoint, in my mind, is he's going to try his best to keep making Nebraska good because, in a way, it's still his alma mater. He mm -hmm. wants Nebraska, whether he's the coach next year or not, he's still going to flip on Sports Center Saturday night or Sunday morning and how did Nebraska do? And so he still cares about this program, whether it works out for him or it doesn't. And so I think that's where he's going to continue to try and recruit the best players to make Nebraska the best they can be going forward. Zach, how intrigued are you about this next coaching hire? Do you have any preferences? I mean, do you have any guys that jump out to you when you kind of look at this next hire? I, I really don't. I mean, I think, you know, so five years ago, Scott Frost was what everybody yeah. wanted. It was the home run. He could have went Florida, Tennessee, wherever. And this year, it in my mind, there's not a clear-cut candidate that says, boom, this is who it needs to be. And I think in a way that's what's maybe opened the door a little bit for Mickey to potentially slide into that role. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there saying, well, we went from one former Nebraska quarterback, do we go to another one? Um, but I think they're completely different people of who they are, um, backgrounds and all of that stuff. So um, I, I'm very interested. I, I think, uh, you know, you could probably pick a, a name out of a hat every day and we may or may not be wrong. It's, you know, and from my mind, from a former player, 
it's you know as close to the vest coaching search that I've seen or experienced because I mean there's not the the no name sources that are out there of mm -hmm. hey it's this person it's going to be this person so you know in a way um, you know in my opinion we're going to find out you know shortly after Iowa uh, because just with everything with the recruiting and dead periods and NIL and all the stuff you got to you got to move quickly yeah we're not even hearing from agents right that's where the leak normally comes from get a, get another coach maybe yep. a raise or extension on their contract we're not even hearing from that. What do you think about Travis Vokalek, who we've seen a lot, and obviously he's still banged up a little bit. He's not that slow going down he's the sidelines. He's not that banged Trust up. Me. Trust me. Trust <laughs> me. You know, you can run faster, but, man, he sure did look like he was slow. But you know what? He got there. Yeah, he did. We've all been in that spot sometime where you've caught a pass or an interception, and, and you feel like you got the whole world just running after you. But as long as you got there. Now, right. if you would have got tackled with a one, that's, that's a little different. But, you know, I go back to Northwestern game ultimately. If he doesn't get hurt Definitely, there, yeah. I think that game's completely different. You know, there are some players that w went in after him that dropped some passes or, you know, maybe it was a bad throw by Casey Thompson or something. But him going out that first game completely changed how that game went. So I'm happy to see him fight back. Um, you know, I think the tight end group has been um, – you know, done better. Obviously, we keep hearing Thomas Fedoni and all these other guys. We yeah. want to we want to make sure the tight end is such a good position um, in this day and age. Whether it's running, passing, blocking, there's so many things that you can do. Right. And I think we have some athletic ones. It's just a matter of making sure that we keep getting the ball and putting in the positions to, to succeed. Zach, you mentioned NIL. Do you, do you keep up with that stuff and follow that? And do you ever think about when you were playing how much NIL opportunity? Yeah. <laughs> some of your, I mean, like, can you imagine and Sue and well, what about Jay Moore and me? Jay yeah. Moore, you <laughs> care about him? Dominic and he was just fine. I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, the, the thing where I think it's very beneficial for is it's obviously beneficial for your out of state people, but your local people, guys like Jay and I, who are, you know, we grew up with people around here. And, you know, but I think that's where Nebraska's put itself in such a great position going forward yeah. is we have a new facility that's opening, we have NIL. There's, you know, there's other things that go on in this state, you know, Creighton basketball, Nebraska volleyball, you know, things that are doing wealth, yeah. but. At the end of the day, it's Nebraska football, and that's where NIL uh, in Nebraska will hopefully succeed uh, going forward. Mickey's scenario coming in as the interim head coach is always a, a very interesting one because he was here, he's got put in the situation, you're able to see him actually be a, what, it would like, what it looks like. You, you can't yep. throw a Dave Aranda, Matt Campbell, whoever it is, and say, what would you do as you, you get the be best case study. But in, in this business as well, it's a win-loss situation, but can we – Totally judge Mickey on every win and loss that he would he's going to he's potentially going to go through this season if, if he would be a good fit for Nebraska. Um, I would say yes and no. No, because in a way, who knows if if Mickey's retained, what does he do with the staff? Who who else does he bring in from his guys? You know, you know, someone like a Bill Bush. He's he's been with Bill for a couple years now yeah. with LSU. Who else could maybe come from that LSU staff of Ed Orgeron and them, or all the other stops that he's been? And so that's where you. I feel like he he will if he is retained, he will make some changes. It's not going to be all the people that are holdovers. But at the same time, I think you can judge it because. It's a long enough or big enough uh, sample size here. You got a lot of games here of putting players in the position um, because at the end of the day, I think they have good players. Um, there's players that can certainly get better, but it's a scheme too. You got to be able to do this. And whether someone like Whipple's retained or um, you know how they do the offense, it'll be interesting to see how it goes with Casey being down. You know that's a completely different ball game with you know with Smothers and uh, uh, Purdy. Talent has to get better though. I, I know they have some good players, but talent across both lines certainly doesn't add up versus Illinois, Minnesota this week, and other teams they've played already. No, I think that's what the, probably the one area where we've missed whether, like Jay said, back to development mm -hmm. or whether it's – I think we've recruited good kids. It's just a matter of how have we've developed them, whether it's in the weight room or on the field from a technique standpoint, of to get better. And that's where – I don't want to say we've struck out by any means, but we haven't developed the lines to be – to have the pass rush that we should have or to be able to block like we should be able to, um, to give the, the quarterback protection, to let him have the throws or open up the running lanes. That's where we failed. When you look, you mentioned earlier about tight ends, and I was trying to think as you said it, I don't know if there's a good NFL team that doesn't have a very good tight end. Waller's been hurt for the Raiders. They look horrible without him. You've got to be able to figure out a way to get that guy. Obviously, he's a blocker too, but get him in routes, take advantage of the middle of the field. There, there's just a tight end, you know, and this dates back to probably when, you know, Gronkowski and Hernandez were with Pats. That's oh, when yeah. the tight end position, I feel like, really took over. Um, you know, Matt Herring and back in the day was more like a wide receiver. Yeah. But, you know, there's so many different things you can do from a matchup-wise. Putting the guys in motion, put them, you know, over 
overload this, get them out on a route. I mean, maybe they're just a decoy or they're just a heck of a blocker. I learned from one of the best, Mercedes Lewis, who's still oh, yeah, playing still for playing the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> and he's just a blocking guy. But at the same time, he can still go out there and catch. And so, you know, you do a fake block and you release and you got a touchdown. There's, there's just so many different things you can do with the tight end position that, you know, I think, you know, Whipple's done a good job with it this year. It's just a matter of making sure the guys have been healthy. Do you think the next coach – and this takes Mickey out of it, obviously, but has to have Power 5 experience as a head coach. Yes. If you're going to make the choice. Yes. Yeah, I think you, you have to. I think Nebraska is just such a different beast. I think that's the only thing where I would say where Mickey, whether he is the guy or not, I think we need to have someone that's had some head coaching experience. I think that's one thing where maybe we overlooked, you know, Frost at all. He had two years at Central Florida. Besides that, you'd just been an assistant. I think right. you have to have some head coaching experience, especially coming into a place like this, because as Trev has mentioned, you have to be that CEO type. You've got to be able to run the organization. And I think that's where you have to have someone that has some Power 5 head coaching experience. When you went through your transition, you were offered by Solich. You came in with Callahan, then played with Bo. I mean, how hard was that just to kind of adjust as a, as a young player? Well, it's challenging. You know, I think that's the one thing that kind of concerns me the most. If if Mickey were uh, to not be retained as the head coach, but maybe retained it on staff, you know, does that create some sort of divide in the head coach and the, the, the holdover in, in Joseph is, you know, if things start going south, oh, gosh, Mickey would have done this if he was. So yeah. if, if Mickey were to stay on staff, that he, those two people got to be, you know, two peas in a pod. They got to be on the same page of how everything goes because they could create a divide really quickly. Um, but ultimately, I think as a transition, you just got to be an open mind. All these, all the kids, I mean, they're kids. Not, I mean, Jay and I, like he said, we're lucky we got to make, make it to the next level. Not all these guys are going to be able to do it. You got to just make sure to do what's best for you. Go to class, get stronger, watch film, go out there and play the best that you can for, you know, not only just the name that's on your chest, but the name on the back. It's, it's your personal brand out there with NIL. I mean, these kids want to go out there and play. Oh, yeah. I guarantee you not one kid on that team is going out there trying to fail on a Saturday or to drop a pass or to miss a block. They're, they all want to succeed, and ultimately they just have to keep working at their craft and keep getting better. I think that's why, based off what you just said, why Dave Aranda keeps getting mentioned so much. They have the prior relationship. Yep. He's got the relationship with Bill Bush. It seems like that would be one that maybe Mickey wouldn't mind coaching with him. You know, it's, it's, it's getting to those kind of levels of, I think, and Jay maybe has mentioned this before in the past, of where Pelini was when he was the D coordinator, interim head coach. Yeah. Fan base is getting behind him. Obviously, this past weekend with the loss, maybe cooled some of that a little bit. But I still think the, the history of Mickey as a recruiter, mm. what him and Bill Bush have been able to do at LSU, and even just coming here, I think that is, that's a strong enough thing saying, hey, um, how can we retain maybe these two guys, or maybe the, there might be other guys on the staff, but I think there's, there's certain things that they bring to the table, uh, whether they're head coach or just uh, on staff that could be beneficial. Another element to everything will be the transfer portal. I mean, yeah. a lot of guys could be thinking transfer portal wasn't around when you played. Um, when you think about your time, I mean, how many guys even talked about transferring? Because it was so much harder. You had to get the release. It had to be certain schools, yeah. I mean, it, but it's it's obviously way easier. When, when you factor when you factor in the transfer portal and NIL, though, yeah. I mean it's not it's there are two things that go together. It's not just transfer portal; it's both. And you know, some guys could be looking at saying, "Hey, if I get in the transfer portal, I can make more money if I go somewhere else like for staying here." Yeah, it's just yeah. and that that's where it's going to be interesting to see depending on who they go with the coach, what coaches are held over or not, or if it's a clean slate. Because at the end of the day, you, you this sounds bad, but a lot of these players, they choose the university for the coach yeah. that's there. I mean, we all, yes, we all choose the university because of different things that they have, but ultimately you're choosing that coach that you want to play for. And that's why the transfer portal, I think, has been the way it is because coaches can jump, but players haven't been able to. Now this at least allows those players to get out and experience certain, certain things if that coach does leave. But at the same time, we might lose a lot of people, but we can get a heck of a lot of people too. And that's where I think you can, this can turn a lot quicker than it has been able to in the past because you can, get, whoever that coach is, can get the guys that he wants in here uh, to make it, you know, his system and how they want to do it. Taping here on Tuesday. Got a pick for the game? 31 30, Nebraska. 31 30. Keeping the streak alive. <laughs> you can't choose against Nebraska. I mean, come on. But there's a, there's a saying you bet with your head, not your heart. And he's not betting. He's uh, not no. betting. <laughs> what about Creighton Prep in the playoffs? You know, they, they, had, they had the toughest schedule to start the season. Yeah. Three losses. They've been playing well. Uh, they got Elkhorn South this week, so that'll be, oh. that'll be a tough one. So, yeah. but, Best team I've seen all year is Elkhorn South. Yeah, be tough. but 
of course, I'll, I'll pick the Junior Jays to, to succeed. <laughs> exactly. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hey, we have a winner in our game day photo contest. Megan Anderson shared this photo with us via Twitter. A fantastic pregame featuring the parachuter dropping into Memorial Stadium. It is a great photo, especially with the American flag right there. Don't forget to send us your best game day photos each week for a chance to win great prizes. Next up on the wrap-up, Sean Callahan is still here with us. We'll walk over to the screen. Busy recruiting week plus a big-time commit. But first, let's take a look from Saturday's game, courtesy of Hale Varsity, back in two. They yeah, can't believe I'm that drill. Be sure to vote on this week's sideline survey. If Casey Thompson can't start, who will Nebraska's quarterback be against Minnesota right now? It's closing up a little bit. Logan Smothers, 56%. Chubba Purdy at 39 And Matt Masker and friends, 5%. <laughs> Make sure you visit the wrap-up website and cast your vote. Welcome back to the show. Michael Severe, Sean Callahan to talk some recruiting. We talked about this guy a little bit, that maybe he might flip from Tulane, and uh, Arnold did. Two commits now for Mickey Joseph in the last two weeks. Uh, Arnold Duda Barnes yeah. um, from Louisiana commits to Nebraska today, uh, giving Nebraska their lone running back recruit. Remember, they took a bunch of them a year ago when you count the portal guys. Uh, but 5'9", 225. Five, nine. Uh, <laughs> more like probably 5'7", 230. Yeah, yeah easily. Yeah. Um, yep. But he's thick. Um, has kind of that Corey Ross build to yes, him. Yep. Gets Watch a low out. pad level. Very elusive. And a Mickey Joseph guy, a New Orleans kid uh, that Mickey's very familiar with, was going to Tulane, who's a top 20 team right now, mm -hmm. in the poll release today. And, you know, he decommitted from Tulane and actually visited Iowa. Then he committed to Nebraska. So mm -hmm. uh, Joseph and that kind of Louisiana bond that he has with these kids yeah. down there really paid off. Famous uh, alumni of Booker T. Washington. Garrett Morris from Saturday Night Live, one of the original primetime See, players. I love the Louisiana guys because you can drop. I got, I got that. This is good <laughs> Michael Severe New Orleans knowledge. I, I've been to Booker T. Washington High School before, <laughs> as my mom went. Official visitors at the Illinois game. Uh, so Nebraska had a, a number of guys in, oh, yeah. unofficial visitors. You had Dylan Riola, the quarterback. Now he's still committed to Ohio State, number right. one player in 2024, uh, but popped in with his brother Dayton, um, who's a younger prospect listed as a quarterback. He looks more like his father. He looks more like an yeah, offensive lineman. Yeah, he's like a, what, he's a center, yeah. Uh, but uh, Dayton Riola, Nebraska, has offered the freshman, the younger brother of Dylan Riola. Yeah. Uh, they were in town, um, wow. saw their uncle um, who coached for Nebraska. Dominic was there, their, yep. um, and then Dominic's father, Tony, um, it was his first trip back to Nebraska since Dominic played. Oh, wow. So they had, it was kind of a big uh, reunion of the Rayolas. Class of 2026. <laughs> that blows my mind every day. We're getting old. Yeah, and Bo Hugley? 
Yeah, then you finally had Bo Healy back. I believe this is his third trip now to Nebraska. Uh, he's committed to Georgia. Um, you know, he's gone to places like Auburn. Yeah, you get some of this. I, I think he likes Nebraska. Yeah. He likes Mickey Joseph. Wait, see what happens. I think he's also interested in the NIL market a little oh, bit. Sure. I think he likes to kind of get a feel for the landscape. But uh, people you talk to at Georgia um, really feel like he's still probably going to end up there. But it is interesting that he's been in Nebraska now multiple times. What are some of the offers we saw this week? Well, Nebra week. Nebraska made a number of offers. Um, you know, you go down the list of guys this past week. Uh, another Juco offer, Denver Warren. Uh, Keelan Smith, a wide receiver. He had Michael Bogna uh, Boganowski, a linebacker. Uh, they're going heavy on JUCOs, though. It's interesting to see. I don't know if anybody in the country has gone as heavy on JUCOs. Uh, a couple offensive tackle offers, as you see there, and then another receiver. So um, yeah. they are being super aggressive for this kind of late in the cycle. Um, but what Mickey said, right, he believes that the JUCO guys are closer to being high school guys. They probably weren't tall enough or didn't have grades. That's why they JUCO. The portal guys have a little more questions. you got to figure out why they're transferring. And you got to deal with more NIL things. you got to deal with more competition. If there's a quality portal, DN, D-tackle, oh, yeah. or O-lineman, they get like 40 offers. Their goal. Yeah. And then the NIL marketplace just skyrockets where a JUCO guy, you might have two or three, and it's a whole different. Like Anthony Grant, there was no NIL involved crazy, to get yeah. him here, and he was the JUCO player of the year. So, right. um, you know, you can find guys, and I think that's – they're trying to go down – it's hard to get down to Kansas to go down and see those guys. And, sure. Uh, they went down there during the bye week and saw some guys. Our in-state recruiters, Devon Hall, uh, great wide receiver. Yeah, four-star right now, uh, Davon Hall, Bellevue West High School. Uh, very, very good player. Nebraska offered him as a freshman. Um, Iowa offered him as a freshman. Yep. I believe to be one of the youngest, if not the youngest ever Husker offer in the state of Nebraska, getting his offer one or two games into his freshman year. Now a junior, um, you know, they have, they've got two Division I receivers right now at Bellevue West. Isaiah McMorris, Davon Hall. Um, I, I think McMorris is very... Is he three, number three? Uh, yeah, he, he's... He's good. And he's actually having a bigger year yeah, he than is. Davon Hall. Yeah. I don't envy the Stu Popsicles of the world yeah. trying to make some of these all-state decisions because there's some really, really good receivers, some numbers being put up um, where, you know, and, and McMorris there at Bellevue West is a D1 guy. I think Nebraska oh, yeah. could end up offering him, too. He had a huge day against Gretna, even though Gretna came back and they got a rematch this week. Any official visitors this weekend? No officials that we know of. Um, 11 a.m. game, remember, too. So, yeah, that's tough to get um, in. The thing I'm going to be watching out for is can they get a couple of these JUCO offers on campus? Because the window is very tight for JUCOs, right. but we're still, you know, the coaching change and things that could happen. There's a lot of unknowns, um, but Mickey's doing a great job putting this class together still. Appreciate it, Sean. We'll see you back on the set. Take a look around the Big Ten now. Minnesota, blanked Rutgers. Of course, Nebraska plays Minnesota this week, 31-0. Iowa's offense all of a sudden rose from the dead, beat Northwestern 33-13. And Michigan toppled in-state, Michigan State, the rival, 29-7. And then they had a big fight in the locker room, which has got a lot of guys suspended. Let's dive into another coaching candidate for Nebraska. This week, it's Chris Peterson. Chris Peterson is interesting <laughs> because he's, you know, he's not coaching. He's doing TV. He stepped away, had an amazing career at Boise, had a really good career at Washington, decided to step away. He'd be a guy that you could actually hire and not have to worry about finishing out with his team. There's a lot of parts to that. I will tell you, since 2010, 3-19, three 3-19 and three and is a dog. When his teams were an underdog, they did not win. When they were favorites, 18, 19 are favorite every game that year. That's when they won their games. When he was an underdog, they didn't win. So, and I question: Is he really on board with the new age college football? Not a lot of people are. Yeah. But NIL. He's a little board. bit younger than some of those other guys but that have left. I, I just, you know, he, his real roots are Boise State. Sure. Didn't have to deal with that kind of stuff up there. Right. Washington, to an extent, didn't have to deal with too much of it when he was there. I think the game has changed so much. Sure. And he said, like, he's done, but. Is he done? That's the question. Yeah, are you done when someone says, here's $8 million? <laughs> are, are you done here's when you have a $50 million guaranteed. When you have a chance to go to a place like Nebraska and revive them, maybe that gives him that energy. I don't know. I, the Pac-12 is different than the Big Ten as well, where the last place he That's, That would be my biggest concern is, okay, Boise State, kind of a, a – they had to do some different things. They had a lot of success. But go to, to go to Washington, had plenty of success, yep. success there. But I don't know how, was, how he performed against Big Ten. I just – you have to have a – I think a, your a coach needs to have a good grasp of how you have to operate in the Big Ten because obviously Scott, <laughs> he, he did not get that memo how, to, how you needed to operate. you you got, you got, to, you got to have a, the right mentality mindset because you just can't try to chuck it 50, 60 times a game in, in this conference. And we're learning that the hard way this year, obviously. When you start looking at teams that made 
the playoff that don't fit, Michigan State and Washington are your two. Those are your two outliers. He's one of the few coaches outside of that Clemson, Georgia, Alabama, you know, teams that have gotten there. Well, now that it's going to go to 12, and we don't know when that's going to actually happen, right. I think some want it sooner than later. You know, the Big Ten and the SEC, is in a, they're in a position to maybe get six of those bids mm -hmm. uh, between the two leagues, maybe seven. I mean, it, you know, there's going to be the automatic bids for the, the six autos. And then, uh, you know, so you're talking if you're nine and three, you could get in the playoffs. Sure. So, you know, there is opportunity for the right guy that comes to Nebraska because Bo Pelini would have had some teams that would have knocked on the door of playoffs on this new 12-team playoffs. Yeah, even 2013 when, uh, you know, you had the injury to Martinez, even that team, you know, they were they played Michigan State late in the year. They only had two losses. It could have easily been a year where they could have ended up in there. Any rumors? You hear anything? I mean, there's nothing. It's so quiet out there. It's amazing. I mean, you hear just some people that might be interested. You know, Dave Dorn at North Carolina yeah. State, Kansas City native that went to college in Drake. Uh, Mark Stoops, Iowa Hawkeye from Ohio. He's kind of topped out at Kentucky. What right. he can do with that program in the SEC East with Georgia and Tennessee. Um, you hear names like that, and, and, and all the Lance Leipold's been kind of the day one guy we've talked about. Uh, Bill O'Brien's been kind of a day one yeah. candidate, but and I know Kleiman's not leaving Kansas State, but right now he's the hot he's guy because of what they just did to Oklahoma State yeah. because of the way they're playing this year. And Trev's doing a really good job of keeping this thing buttoned up, and, yeah. and that's how these searches really should be done. Oh, I couldn't agree more. But it's hard to do it that way. You want to tell us? I mean, like, well, today's day and age, it's extremely hard with right. how many media outlets there are and just how many people that can leak the information for for the benefit of a certain coach, an agent, whatever, for monetary reasons. But we have literally have got nothing, and I, it's, and I'm, I'm okay with that to be honest because I don't like to hear the he said, she said stuff. I'd like, you know, there's no, I don't, I don't want to get caught up in the. This the back and forth of oh it's this guy oh I hear it's this guy it's just that gets exhausting and now you're hearing Mickey Joseph's right. name at Arizona State yeah uh, which mm -hmm. is interesting um, and Colorado's a possibility Arizona State you think on paper that's a good job they've got some major sanctions oh. that are spooked and you don't know what's gonna happen with the Pac-12 and th so the candidates are spooked to go to Arizona State because of some of those things so Mickey you know we we report on Husker Line today there, that there has been at least some informal contact made. Um, you know, to Joseph, his yeah. camp at least, about that Arizona State job. I'm not saying that's planted, but the best thing for Mickey would be to have that out there because it puts a little bit more pressure There's, on Trev. It puts more pressure definitely. on the job you have. You have the, you, got, you got that. You have the Sports Illustrated article. Then you had the journey deal with Mickey. So there's been yep. a lot of positive pub publicity on Mickey's side to kind of, you know, make Trev think about, you know, doing. Because there's, there's, that's just the, the, the cool thing about it is – he gets to see exactly how Mickey would operate. That's just the biggest thing. That's why I asked Zach the whole win-loss situation because it does matter. But it's this year's you're, you're taking over a team mid-year. Things weren't going. You know, you weren't doing uh, right uh, before Mickey. Uh, Scott wasn't doing things right before Mickey got here. So he's taking over. You know, uh, a, a team that's kind of limping into the you know the season. So, uh, but you get to see exactly how he operates. And the guy's putting a ton of effort into it. You talk about the recruiting, just yep. keep the energy up, the the mojo within the team. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot of things to consider with Mickey. We, we went over a lot of quarterbacks when we were doing the survey, but we didn't mention Heidrich Harburg. Have you heard a lot about him at all? Well, he's not traveling, so that that's kind of indicator number one that he's not in the conversation. And, and today, Mickey was asked about him and kind of dismissed it right away, um, like he did about Richard Torres on Saturday. Now, Richard Torres has got a beautiful arm. I mean, yeah. he throws he said the he's ball, just not ready. but he's just not ready. Coming off an ACL, played lower level San Antonio high school football. <laughs> you know, I'll joke and throw Mikey Pauly out there, the baseball player. Sure, he was the Kansas City High School Football Player of the Year came to play baseball for Will Bolt, but right. had D1 quarterback offers from both Lance Leipold and Chris Kleiman. And watching football on Saturdays, those two programs seem to know how to identify and develop quarterbacks. So Mikey Pauly is kind of a sleeper name that could be in a quarterback conversation someday. Jay, how do you get, I mean, everything last week kind of ended any chance you had to get to a bowl game, mm -hmm. kind of ended any goal maybe you had for the season. How do you have the team ready to go on Saturday if they don't have their starting quarterback 11 o'clock against that big Minnesota team. You just got to you got to push effort. You know you got the fight. You know I think the the kids had it written on their you know their tape. You know never out of the fight. I right. think you got to continue with with that you know creed. You know the that that message because it's hard. You know I've uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the Nebraska teams. We were you know playing for bowl games. I've been a part of a lot of poor professional teams. Oh yeah. 
where you're out there and you're just playing for pride. And the thing you'd always tell yourself is that film is always on. You do not ever want to oh. put bad tape on. There's nothing worse than watching tape where you absolutely played terrible. You're sitting there, you're slouched in your chair, you're just getting chewed you're out. You're rewinding it. Yes, <laughs> what's going on here, Jay? What's, yeah. You don't want that. And yeah. that's, that's something, that just comes from a pride issue, you gotta dig deep. But, I mean, <sighs> crazier things have happened, right? I, it's this thing, you, you, there's, there's chance, like there is an outside chance they could beat Minnesota. There's zero outside chance I think they can beat Michigan, but there's an outside chance they could beat Wisconsin. There's an outside chance sure. they can beat Iowa. So there is something to that. It's not like they're a 31 point underdog, they're 15 points, you know, they do some things, get the ball to bounce the right way. Hey, crazier things have happened. So I sure. think there's that too, but the biggest thing is just, hey, that film's on, take pride in how you operate, take pride in what you do, play for that N on the side of your helmet, play for that name on your back as well, you're representing your family. So that's, I think, the message you gotta put forward to your team. We've talked a lot about who might come back. Obviously, Mickey's got a lot of guys. Apple White's one, Bill Bush is one, maybe Barrett Root is one, but this seems like this is the end for Mark Whipple. Does it feel that way to you? Yeah, 65, um, his battle health problems. I mean, you know, we've, we've seen him at Rutgers have to use a, a golf cart to get off the field. Yeah. I mean, he's grinding through a lot of pain, you can yeah. tell, as a coach. Um, so, yeah, you wonder what his long-term outlook is as a coach. Um, he's got great concepts in play. He understands the game, and if he's got the players, I think sure. he can draw plays to get anyone in the football. Mm -hmm. We've seen that. Um, but, yeah, you, you wonder where he's at long-term. I can't imagine him being a part of a new coach's plan here because the new coach is going to bring his own guy yeah and if, if Mickey is kept most likely wouldn't be as a coordinator wouldn't be an OC. Be associate head coach yeah. probably you'd title him up you'd probably get a raise salary. right he's at 600 maybe he's made I mean who knows what the pay will be because yeah. a lot of that would depend on the new guy and sure would they get along do they want to work together right. those are things that we don't know and there are no there's been some confusion there are no guarantees that Mickey Joseph has a spot on the next staff like right. that is not no one can make that guarantee the next coach has to make, will have to make that decision yep. Give me a burning question <laughs> my burning question is what will this offense look like at quarterback so many so many things that we don't know will we see two or will they give Logan Smothers more opportunity yep can Nebraska create turnovers the the defense has has gotten here uh, some um, sporadically throughout the season can they get Nebraska somehow into the plus turnover category defensively to give them a chance to win this football game? My question is simple. Can Nebraska flip the script on P.J. Fleck? Remember, last couple times, Nebraska was real. Minnesota was down a lot of players, and Nebraska was favored, but Minnesota won. Can Nebraska do it this way? Don't forget to head to our website and click on the predictions. Jay, Sean, and myself will tell you exactly what to expect on Saturday. The Oscars welcome in Minnesota Memorial Stadium for an 11 a.m. kickoff. You can find the game on ESPN2. We'll be back next Tuesday to recap that game with our special guest, Brandon Vogel from Hale Varsity. Also on Saturday, our Nebraska Public Media sports crew is out in full force for the 2022 NSAA Volleyball Championships. Six games throughout the day starting at 9 a.m. Catch some high-level high school volleyball right here on the home for volleyball, Nebraska Public Media. Our thanks to Zach Potter and our student volunteers in the call center for joining us tonight. For Jay Moore and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week on Big Red Wrap-Up.